Of the goodness of God. 
Thank you. 
look And even when I can't feel it, you work it You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I can't see it, you work it Even when I can't feel it, you work it
Jesus, the Son of God, hung on a cross to Appreciation for salvation. We have so much to be thankful for. Before we uh, started the music, I have a bad habit when I'm on the piano of looking around and seeing things happen and losing my spot. You all have heard that, I'm sure. <laughs> and so before the music started, Tammy... Uh, looked at me and she said, focus, focus, focus. <laughs> I said, on what? <laughs> but did you know your focus has everything to do with your thanksgiving and your happiness and your joy and your peace in your life? What you choose to focus on can change your day. And so uh, in 2 Corinthians 9, 15, Paul says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Amen. Now, appreciation is the key to contentment. And I know some of us have faced some incredible things in the last few years. How many since 2020 has faced things you never thought you'd face in your life? Just things that are shocking and, and horrible and hard to go through. And I'm not minimizing that. But I'm saying you've got more blessings then you've got problems if you'll just learn to focus. Colossians 3.15 says, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you were called in one body, say it with me, and be thankful. Philippians 4.11, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I'm in to be content. Now, Paul is writing from a prison cell. He's been beaten and whipped and stoned and shipwrecked and spent a day and the night in the deep. Anybody read what all he went through? But he said, I know how it is to abound and have plenty. I know what it is to be broke and have nothing. But I have learned that whatever condition or state I'm in, I can have contentment because of Jesus. And so... Second, or 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world. Amen. And it is certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and clothing with these things, we shall be content. Listen to this in Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, 
For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And if we could learn to just focus on the things that God has given us and the blessings that we do have, maybe then we wouldn't be so depressed and dissatisfied all the time. I know people that always think if I can get that next thing. I remember thinking, boy, if I could just get through high school. And then thinking, boy, if I could just get married. <laughs> huh? And then if I could just buy that house, and then you get that house, and, well, what if I could get this? Or I have this car, what if I could get that? Let me tell you something. Jesus said a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things that he possesses. And if you will learn to have the peace of God in your heart, whether you're broke or able to be generous and give to others, you can have the peace of God and you can walk in contentment and happiness. You really can. But where are you focusing? And so, a lack of thankfulness brings self-destruction. Listen to Romans 1, 20 through 21. For since the creation of the world... His invisible, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. You say, what about people who've never heard of Jesus? There is enough evidence in creation to prove that there's a Creator. I was watching National Geographic and they were talking about the intricacies and the design of these unusual sea animals and how well they're designed for their environment. And then they said they evolved after, said, after saying they have design. You can't have design without a designer. You can't have creation without a creator. And so it's silly. I watched some programs on TV where they were talking about Thanksgiving and being thankful, but they never said who to be thankful for. If you're going to give thanks, there needs to be somebody to give it to, right? So not only to the Lord, but to your loved ones around you. Tell whoever you're near, thank God for you. Amen. You're going to bless me and make me closer to God one way or another. You get it? Amen. Amen. And so, lack of thankfulness. And he says, they're without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful. I want to say it again. Nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish Hearts were darkened. Now, if you read Romans 1, you'll see the, the dissension into chaos, and it begins with, they weren't thankful. Our nation is being destroyed by those who have no appreciation for the blessings and the freedoms that we have. I don't know about you. I, some of these, now I'm just going to, you know, I don't care. But some of these who are defending Hamas, what if they had to live under Sharia law where they throw gays off of rooftops to kill them? Are you hearing me? They do. And if you tried to be a transgender, they wouldn't just mock you. They would destroy you. They destroy Christians. They destroy Jews. Their goal is to wipe Israel and the United States off the face of the earth. That's their goal. Now, I'm not talking about Arab people or Palestinian people. I'm talking about these terrorists or anybody who ascribes to radical Islam. And when I see our college students rioting in the streets and yelling and protesting, I'm thinking, you don't know what you're doing. You have no clue of what a blessed nation you live in that you're even able to get out in the streets and protest. And you know what? Even if you don't agree with me, you have a right to protest. You don't have a right to tear everything up, though. Amen. My dad was a World War II veteran, and he saw the evils of the Third Reich and the axis of evil. What Can you imagine? You see, a lot of our young people don't even know that Hitler would have ruled the world as a cruel dictator, as cruel as what you're seeing in the anti-Semitism today. And with all of his evil... 
uh, there would have been no freedoms. But people laid their lives on the line so we could have the liberties that we have today. And I'm telling you, folks, when you can come here on a Sunday morning and not worry about it, you ought to be thankful. When you can get up tomorrow and go to work, when they don't tell you, when you can own property, when you can have a driver's license and drive a car. Did you know, ladies, under Sharia law, women aren't even allowed to drive vehicles or go anywhere without a male chaperone? But, oh, we're oppressive. And the United Nations takes these kinds of people and puts them in authority about human rights. I'm like, what kind of joke is this? Did you know that on the flip side of that, communism, those that believe in Islam, some are imprisoned right now in prison camps in communist China. But we'll support China and rail against our own. Now, I know our government isn't the best. I know we've got corrupt people in power, you know, but I'm telling you, it's still, you've got a lot to be thankful for, that you live in the good old U.S. of A. You've got a lot to appreciate being here where you can worship, where you can have the freedoms. And so Paul said there were those that would, he's talking about Judaism in the text, but he said those come in to spy out your liberty and they take advantage of your liberty to destroy your liberty. Don't be fooled by it. Amen. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. And I appreciate the liberties that we have. Amen. Why is this happening? Because our, many of our colleges are being funded by China, by Marxists, and by extreme Islamic groups. And so they're indoctrinating our young people to believe things that are absolutely absurd. You're getting ready to go to college, get a good education. God bless you. But get educated, not indoctrinated. Amen. The lack of thankfulness will bring self-destruction. Our nation is destroyed by those who have no appreciation for blessings and freedoms. And another thing that will, will just destroy your thankfulness and your appreciation is trying to find happiness in things. I've already alluded to this, but I want to say a few more things about it. Listen to this proverb, Proverb 27, 20. Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man or women are never satisfied. I know people who are multimillionaires, and they're way up in years, and they're still trying to pull tricks to make more money as if they could spend what they have in their lifetime. And they're miserable. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And I'm not saying it's wrong to have finances because how are you going to help somebody else if you don't? But if you think that new house or that new car or that next thing that you buy is going to make you happy, you're going to continually chase after something you won't ever get. Say, well, Pastor, what, what about the, the pursuit of happiness? Well, that's in the Declaration. That's not in the Bible. Forget about pursuing happiness. P pursue the Lord. Pursue doing good for others and watch happiness catch up with you. Amen. Amen. Like a kid chasing his shadow. Did anybody ever see that? All he has to do is turn toward the sun and the shadow will keep up with him. Right? And so I want you to see that you're not going to find it. Beware of covetousness. One's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. Being thankful for what you have has a whole lot to, to do with God blessing you even with more. I don't know about you, but if I give my kids stuff and they don't appreciate it, I'm not in a hurry to give them anything else. And we live in a day where it's all about things. You ever watch kids at Christmas time now? They'll rip open one package after another after another, and when they get done unwrapping two dozen gifts, they'll look for something else and be upset there's not more to unwrap, and then they'll play with the boxes instead of the toys. We, we don't appreciate... You know what? In Haiti, I watched as the smallest gift given to a child was such appreciation... I remember I gave a candy bar to this little fella. It's a pretty good sized candy bar. And he smiled and lit up and broke it into five pieces and shared it with his friends. 
And they were all happy to get a bite. And I'm like, God, help us to appreciate what we have. I remember 46 years ago when we first got married, I used to say I drove a vehicle kind of like Fred Flintstones. You could stick your feet through the floor to stop it. Uh, rusty. We lived in a little old apartment that had been in a garage that had mice in it. And my wife still hates mice to this day. But can I tell you, I, I was working at F.W. Woolworth, 5 and 10. Anybody remember that? And, and making $75 a week, and it left us sometimes about 10 bucks for groceries. We were as happy as we could be. Because it's not about things. You know, sometimes the more you have in the stock market, and the more you have of material things, the harder it is for you to go to sleep because you're worried about what's going to happen to it. And I just want you to be thankful for what you have. Because I'm telling you what, if, if, if you're really appreciative of what you have, that's where the peace and the contentment comes from. I read a story last night, and it was in an old book, and it said these travelers were moving through Europe, and they met the devil himself. And the devil said, I want you to come into my barn. I want to show you what I have in store for people. And he had huge bags with seeds of hatred. He had a huge supply of seeds of bitterness. He had a huge supply of seeds of unforgiveness. He had a huge supply of seeds of greed. And they asked him, they said, do those grow all over the world? He said, they grow almost everywhere. And they said, is there anywhere they won't grow? He said, yeah, they won't grow in the heart of someone that's full of thankfulness and peace. Are you thankful? Instead of complaining about all those dirty dishes, thank God you had all that food to eat. Amen. I found myself grumbling for paying insurance on more than one vehicle, and then I realized what a blessed brat I am. Are you hearing me? The things that we complain about, the things that we grumble about, we've got so much to be thankful for, and I know that uh, I'm thankful for you all, that you would spend your Sunday to come out here to hear the Word of God and to, to join together in worship. I appreciate that, and I thank you for being here this morning. Paul said to the church at Thessalonica, we give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers. Amen. So can I just talk about some things I'm thankful for? I'm thankful for our freedoms. I've already mentioned that, but I want to say it again. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I'm thankful for the freedom I have in Jesus. Here's what the devil tells people. If you go to get right with God, they won't let you have any fun at all. Amen. Amen. Why, you can't party like you did, and you can't get blasted drunk, and you can't, you can't smoke and run around with women, and you can't do this, and you can't do that. But you know what? He's a liar. Everything he offers brings you into bondage. Doesn't it? Addictions, it destroys relationships and destroys families. I thank God that when Jesus set me free, he didn't set me free to where I could do whatever I wanted to do. He set me free where I could have peace in my heart and live in fellowship with God. That's the kind of liberty I'm appreciative of this morning. I am so thankful for you all being here this morning and listening to this message and joining in the worship. I'm thankful that I know Jesus. Oh, that's got to be number one, doesn't it? As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted up and built up in Him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Hallelujah. Thank God you know the Lord. You're going to glory in anything. How, how can you be discontent if you really are walking with him and talking with him and he's in fellowship with you? 
And you know what? Not only am I thankful that I know him, I just want to show you a bunch of things I'm thankful to the Lord for today, okay? I'm thankful that he became flesh and experienced the human condition. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are. Can you imagine that? Jesus was tempted with everything you've ever been tempted with. Is that the Bible? So I read the temptation in the wilderness. Well, maybe you should look at the conclusion of that again because it said the devil only left for a little season. He came back. And so I want you to know that whatever you're struggling with in your human flesh, whether it's lust, whether it's greed, whether it's bitterness, whether it's unforgiveness, when you go to Jesus, he in his human form was tempted with that and he knows how that temptation feels. That's incredible. You see, here's what the devil does. We shared this at a Bible study this week. He'll put a thought in your head that isn't right, and then he'll make you feel guilty for thinking it, right? He'll put a desire in your life that isn't right, and then he'll make you feel guilty for desiring it. Now, get this. If Jesus was tempted in all points, there's no such thing as a desireless temptation, right? Right? And so the fleshly desire was there. But you see, you don't have to give in to it. You see, sin, lust when it's conceived will bring forth sin. And sin when it's finished, James says, will bring forth death. So I want you to hear this. You have a high priest that understands your human condition. Aren't you glad about that? And so when you go to him and say, Lord, I'm really struggling with this. You know what he can say? I know how you feel. He was born to a race that is still hated and despised today. So he knew what racism was. He wasn't born extremely wealthy and he knew what it was to leave the riches of glory and grow up as a common carpenter. He knew what it was to be rejected by his own brothers until after the resurrection. Are you hearing me? He knew what it was to be ridiculed, made fun of, hated. But aren't you glad he never sinned? Aren't you glad he experienced what we experienced? So when I say, Lord, I need your help, hallelujah, I'm not talking to a calloused force up there in the beyond somewhere. I'm talking to a personal Savior who has flesh and blood or flesh and bones. Amen? Amen. We have one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus Listen, we have not a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. He was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So go to God with boldness and assurance of his mercy when you mess up. Did you hear me? When do you need mercy and grace? When you do everything right? Do you see this? There's no other, there's nothing in the world like the gospel that we preach. Man could not have invented this. Amen. That we can come to his throne boldly whenever we need mercy, whenever we need grace, and we can say, Father, I know I've sinned, but the Bible says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Aren't you glad? What a, he's an approachable Savior. Can I show you something else in that verse that changed my life? One thing changed my life. I, I was raised in the old school church. Man, were they tough. Amen. I really thought it was the job, the preacher's job to send everybody to hell instead of everyone to hell. <laughs> All right. <laughs> But notice where Jesus is seated. The throne of grace. Say that with me. The throne of grace. Somebody said grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. When we approach him with a repentant heart, he's not sitting on the white throne judgment. He's not seated on a throne of judgment. He's seated on the mercy seat, the throne of grace. If, that don't give, if, if you're not thankful for that, I don't know what you'd be thankful for. Amen. 
I'm thankful that he was a perfect example. I'm thankful he understands what it's like to be human, but I'm also thankful that he didn't act like I do sometimes. Amen? Amen. Come on now. I'm thankful he was a perfect example. 1 John 2, 6, He who says he abides in him ought himself to walk just as he walked. <laughs> so, well, how do I handle that? How do I deal with that? Read the four Gospels. Familiarize yourself with the life of Jesus and watch what it will do in your life. Okay? I'm thankful that he showed us how much God loves us. John 17, his high priestly prayer before he goes to the cross. And the glory which you gave me I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. I and them and you and me that they may be made perfect in one that the world may know that you have sent me and has loved them as you have loved me. Did you hear that? God loved you so much that the only way he could show you he loved you as much as he loved his only begotten was to let him die in your place. I'm thankful for redemption through his finished work on the cross. Redemption. Say that word with me. Redemption. You know. Anybody ever get in a tight spot and take something down to the pawn shop and they give you a few dollars for it, but you have a ticket that if you don't wait too long, you can go back and redeem it. <laughs> Adam sold us out. Adam and Eve sold us out in the garden. And your God is not only merciful, but he is so just to buy back your soul. He was willing to pay the ultimate price you know why? Because it shows you your value. How valuable are you to Jesus? Look at the cross. Amen. Say, well, not me. <laughs> yes, you are. You were created in the image of God, and he values you so much that he gave his life for you. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 1, 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition of your fathers. <laughs> Anybody else have aimless conduct and your family was that way too? He said, huh? Oh, well. What were you redeemed with? But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Something much more precious than all the mansions, all the silver, all the gold, all the wealth of this world. The blood of Jesus. Tell, tell the person next to you, you were worth the blood of Jesus. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. I'm thankful that justice... And mercy met at Calvary. Hallelujah. Justice. Say, so, well, why did God, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? Because God is a just God, and a justice demands that the penalty is paid. But he's also a merciful God that wants to give you grace. And so at the cross, when he took your place and my place, justice and mercy met. Listen to this psalm because I see it fulfilled at the cross. Psalm 85, 10 and 11. Who is the truth? Before we read this. Who is the truth? Jesus. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth shall spring out of the earth. <laughs> And righteousness shall look down from heaven. Aren't you glad that on the third day the truth sprang out of the earth? Praise God. I thank God for the cleansing blood that restores us to fellowship with God. 
Uh, listen, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Aren't you glad you can walk with him and talk with him and, and fellowship with him? I hope that this isn't the only time you talk to the Lord's when you're here on Sunday morning. Because he paid an awesome price so that you could come back in and not only enter the Holy of Holies, but you became the temple of God and he put a Holy of Holies within you where he dwells. And you can commune with him daily. Thank God that we are back in fellowship with the Lord. I'm so thankful for that. Next thing I'm thankful for, I'm thankful for the ever abiding presence of the Holy Ghost. Amen. John 14, 16, I will pray the Father. He'll give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. That he may just hang out until you make a mistake and then leave you. Huh? I used to hear him say that when I was a kid. Well, you sinned and the Holy Ghost won't dwell in an unclean temple. I'm cleansed by the blood of Jesus is how he came in, but he, he's not, he's not going to leave you when you mess up. Matter of fact, I know he don't because when I mess up, he talks to me, yeah. right? And he, he tells me, you need to make that right. You know better. He said he won't leave you, the ever-abiding presence. How, he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Hallelujah. I have a father that is eternal. He dwells in me through the Holy Ghost. I have his presence. I have his power, and I sure appreciate that. Somebody say, thank God for the Holy Ghost. I'm thankful that he will never leave me or forsake me. Now we're going to go back to Hebrews 13, 5 that I read at the beginning of this message. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said... I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, there was a little boy at school that was being threatened by a bully. And the bully came to beat him up. And the little boy put up his little fists. And he was scared to death. All of a sudden, the bully looked scared and turned and ran. And he thought, wow, I'm tough. But he turned around to see his big brother behind him. Aren't you here? You hear what I'm saying? Go ahead, devil. <laughs> Threaten me. I have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. So come on, because I don't have to handle you on my own. The Lord is my helper. I'm not afraid of what you're going to do to me, because I have help through the Lord himself. Amen. Are you thankful that you're saved? The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. Let's read the rest of it, though. But the gift of God is eternal life. Say that with me. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful, so thankful for his ever abiding presence. I'm thankful for the beautiful family that he's given me. I'm thankful for the loved ones I have. They get on my last nerve, every one of them from one time to another. And so do your loved ones. But aren't you thankful that they're there? Amen. Appreciate what you have. Praise God. Thanksgiving is a reoccurring theme throughout the Psalms. Psalm 100, make a joyful noise. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. 
Well, I went to church, but I didn't feel nothing. Did you enter his gates with thanksgiving? Huh? You can come in the building and not be in the church. Amen. But oh, if you come in with thanksgiving and praise, you enter in to the throne room. You can come before that throne of grace I was talking to you about. You can get right up there with the apostles and the loved ones that have gone on before, and we can gather around the throne and worship Him. Amen. But I am so thankful that I know His name. Moses has this encounter at the burning bush, and He's shaking and he's taking his shoes off and he's bowing before the presence of a holy God. And God said, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. But he said, Lord, if you send me back to them, give me your name so I can tell them, what is your name? They're serving a God up to Exodus 2 and they don't have a name. And God said, I am that I am. Tell them, I am has sent me unto you. Do you understand what a beautiful thing that is? He's not the I was. He's not the I will be. He dwells in eternity. And wherever you are, the I am has produced the remedy for your problem before your problem ever existed. Amen. He appears throughout the Old Testament and they'll ask his name he'll say why do you ask my name that's a secret but one day an angel appeared to a little teenage virgin girl and said thou shalt bring forth the son and call his name Jesus or he shall save his people from their sins aren't you glad you know the name of Jesus Anybody stand with me if you love the name of Jesus. You can. Lord, when the devil comes and all hell assails, I watched the testimony of a converted Muslim the other day. And he said he was sincerely seeking the Lord. <laughs> and there was an appearance. And this one said, he said, who are you? And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But he'd never read St. John, so that didn't mean a lot to him. He's like, well, what is your name? And he said, I'm Jesus. You know the name to call on. Somebody said, well, it's Yeshua. Yeah, it's Yeshua in Hebrew. It's in every language all over the earth. But how many know he knows his name when you call on his name? I'm so thankful that I'm not calling on Muhammad or Buddha or Ashereth or some foreign God that doesn't exist, but I'm calling on one who is well able to answer. He is alive and his name is above every name. Someday every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name given under heaven among men whereby you must be saved. Let's worship him through the authority of his name. Altars are open. Are you thankful this morning? Give him a hand of praise.